the same vein as the sanctuary, and what a rich study this one is. What a rich... I mean, when you're studying the sanctuary, I'll just say, in my short Christian experience that I've had, when it comes to a particular study that I do, the one that always bears the most fruit in understanding what God is doing in the world, what he has done in the past, what to expect in, in prophetic future, the things that are distractions, the things that are solid and concrete that we need to adhere to. I've never had a study that bears more fruit. And there are some very, very great studies you can do. But by far, as the saying goes, the sanctuary takes the cake. The biggest growth I've seen in my own Christian experience, knowledge and understanding has come from the study of this particular subject. Yes. Mrs. Tabari said, if you don't understand the sanctuary, you don't understand the plan of salvation. And I would say, absolutely. And you don't understand. You can't understand proper, uh, properly prophecy and the, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. What it all means. How the law, how the penalty of the law had to be paid. How, how sin is somehow removed from the sinner placed upon the substitute, and then the sinner now can walk in newness of life. It's all found in the sanctuary. Paul? Well, that's one point of present truth. Absolutely. So there will be a great deal of interest in it because the Lord knew that when he made the third angel's message, the one prong of present truth is the sanctuary. Absolutely. So there will be great interest in it. Absolutely. This is what I believe Mrs. White refers to as the science of Christianity. This is it. This is, this is exactly how it's done, if you will. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's have a word of prayer. We haven't done that yet. So, Dear Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we, we welcome and we, we treasure your presence here with us today, Lord. Because without you here, these are just pictures and words on a slide. These are just thoughts. But with your spirit, they can be something much more. Help us to understand your sanctuary. Help us to understand the Passover, Lord, and what it means to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Passover in particular um, is a very... It's a very, very important feast day, and this, we're, we're, that's where we're going into. We're going into the feast day section now of the sanctuary. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, the Passover is the one that's mentioned most often. Okay, so it's very important. It typifies more than the others. They all typify Christ, but it typifies Christ's death more than the others. Okay? Every single one of, remember, every single one of the, the sacrifices, the offerings, they all typified the fact that in order to come into communion with God, that the sin problem had to be dealt with, whether it was the sin offering or the burnt offering, which is really a sacrifice of ourselves in consecration to God, but even the peace offerings, we cannot even approach God without Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that's what every single one of the feast days and every single one of the offerings point to. There always had to be that sacrificial lamb, ram, or bullock offering. For the Passover, it's a lamb. Now, Christ is the Passover. Now, once again, we just stated that Christ is really the key that unlocks them all. But he is the Passover lamb, specifically. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
Now, when he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, does he mean to the letter of the feast as the Jews kept it in, Christian, in the Christian era? No. He means spiritually speaking, right? Just like we are circumcised in the heart. So spiritually speaking, the ordinance itself, when type met anti-type, was, let's say, fulfilled, okay? It was fulfilled. Therefore, the ordinance itself, the feast day itself, is not to be practiced. We are not to sacrifice more lambs because the lamb of God has been sacrificed. Peter says it another way. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So Christ is our lamb. And again, this is a, Revelation sort of echoes this, this passage here when it says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Before earth was created, this deal was, was made because God knew it was coming. God knew it was coming. Now, Jesus, this is, what's, this is why the Passover is so probably typifies his death most, is because Jesus actually died on the Passover. In comparison with the other feasts, he did not. So he died on the Passover itself. Mark chapter 14, Verses 1 and then 16 through 18 says this, After two days was the feast of Passover and of unleavened bread. And they go hand in hand. They're right th together with each other. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me and we know the rest of the story from there so he's in the upper room the night comes right and remember how is it how is a day calculated in the bible from what time to what time from sundown to sundown so as soon as it's dark it's the next day okay it's the next day so in the upper room they're celebrating the passover jesus died that day right that very day before nightfall right he died before nightfall because they were trying to get him right to his tomb before the sabbath drew on right so that they could keep the sabbath and not be working on the sabbath so he died that evening that same day so he celebrates he in the upper room he's he's celebrating the passover meal unleavened bread the wine this is my body which is broken for you instituting on the passover a new custom right a new ordinance which was communion so communion has taken the place of passover now paul and then i uh, will read this quote from desire of ages you know something you said and it is very true that the priests the sanhedrin the general conference were in a hurry to get this done so they weren't quote working on the Sabbath, unquote. Isn't that insane? <laughs> However, in doing what they were, this is an object lesson. They were working for the devil on the Sabbath, full bore, doing the devil's best work, and here they think they're serving God. What's going on today? If we're not keeping the Sabbath the way Jesus Christ did, we are working for the devil, whether we like it or not. Absolutely. So it's pretty interesting object lesson. Touch not, taste not, doctrines of demons. Working on the Sabbath for Lucifer when we're not doing it Christ's way. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's just, it's crazy, isn't it? The God that instituted the Sabbath, people were, were taking down the creator who had died for the world, and they had to hurry up 
and put them in the tomb so that they could keep the Sabbath. Think about that. That's insane, isn't it? But that's, that's, that's the climate that they lived in then. And the same is, there, is here now. You have the Pharisaical side, the ultra-conservative side, right? Goes way above and beyond uh, what would be acceptable as a Christian doctrine, right? We have that. Then you have the Sadducees, right, who didn't believe anything. They're practically atheists and liberals, right? We see that today, too. So the same, the, same, the same baseline, the same cultural temperature, if you will, is we're living in it right now. Paul? I, I don't want to pull your study in a different direction, but it goes back another step. Who did the Seventh-day Adventist church choose as their leader when they were given a choice? A Barabbas Christ, yeah. by name, son of Barabbas, the son of the Father. And we're told that when Jesus left the holy place, the devil usurped his seat. Beware, Seventh-day Adventists, who you are serving. So they chose a false Christ. Here they are crucifying on the Sabbath day the Savior, the Creator. So now you've got the sanctuary and what's coming into it? Present truth, what's coming into it? The Sabbath plays a big role here. Huge, huge. And you know what's interesting? Huge bombshell for everybody here. You had three major groups. There was a few others also. There's the Essenes and the Zealots and, and things like that. Those, those were other groups. But as far as in Jerusalem, you had three major groups. You had the Sadducees camp, right, very liberal. You had the Pharisaical camp, very ultra-conservative. I mean, if you carried a handkerchief in your pocket, you could be carrying a burden on the Sabbath. That's how ridiculous some of this stuff was. Some of this stuff, you couldn't go see your neighbor, unless. but if your, if your roofs were so close to each other where they touched, it wasn't considered going to see your neighbor because you guys were under one roof, so that was allowed. That's the type of stuff. And we see this in Adventism and other parts of Christianity today. That was the other group. And then the third group, was the Herodians, who were, were looking towards this outside, very ecumenical, if you will, looking towards this outside. Uh, Herod was this, uh, from Edom, right? Looking for him to, to revive Jewish nationalism, and they were all fully on board with that. Who were all three of those groups answering to, dealing with, consulting with all the time? Rome, all three of them. Now, if the cultural climate from then is going to match the cultural climate of today, what should we expect to see in the Pharisaical camps, ultra-conservative, in the ultra-liberal camps, Sadducees, and then in the uh, ecumenical camps, what should we see? Rome, Rome. Now, uh, getting back to the Passover here, just interesting political backdrop. That's all the backdrop of where the time Jesus is living here. Listen to this from Mrs. White. Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself a sin offering that he would thus bring to an end, bring to an end, right, the system of types and ceremonies that uh, for 4,000 years had pointed to his death. Okay, so he's bringing those to an end. So are we to keep those now? Is that a salvational issue now? No. But we still ought to learn it and learn the principles. That, as I stated in the beginning, extremely fruitful. As he ate the Passover with his disciples, he instituted in its place the service that was to be the memorial of his great sacrifice. The national festival of the Jews was to pass away forever. The service which Christ established was to be observed by his followers in all lands and through all ages. Desire of Ages, page 652. So the Passover itself really didn't go away. It's actually, uh, it's been reinstituted in a new symbol. Now think about this for a second. You have sections of time, right? And we've talked about this many times in our sanctuary study. You have the, the section of time which is in the outer court, right? Prophetically speaking. 
then Christ steps into the holy place, right? Then Christ steps into the most holy place. Each time, he has a different church. And the, the standards raise for that church, okay? So you had, the whole, you had the old Jewish economy, and before then, with the types and rituals and ceremonies, right? When Christ typified those things, right, in 31 A.D., and then 34 A.D., when that time prophecy we all know about comes to an end, when the stoning of Stephen, Christ instituted a new church, right? And that was the Christian church. And he stepped into a new phase of ministry. Taking that part of that same time prophecy down to its closing, we get to when? 1844. So it, only, it would only go to make sense that if Christ is stepping into a new phase of ministry, that he's about to shake up the church again, right? So what did he do? He created a church of the churches, right? He, he, he took a nation, which was a remnant of the earth, and then he took a remnant of that, and now he's taking a remnant of the Christian church, and that's his remnant church, and that's the church that will go through to the end. Interesting thoughts, huh? Right all here in the sanctuary. Right all here in the sanctuary. That should help your faith if you've chosen to be a Seventh-day Adventist because who else has that doctrine? Who else even cares? Who else really cares about the sanctuary? I've never heard anything about the sanctuary other than in the Seventh-day Adventist faith. And they say, yes, they do. They say it's not important. They, I had someone summarize all of Leviticus for me one time and saying, this just kind of shows you the, the reason why God instituted this and all these symbols and types is because this shows you how, how serious sin is. Okay. While that might be very, a very true uh, detail that you can glean from that, there's so, many, there's so many specific instructions in there. Are you going to tell me that all those are just kind of just ceremonial things and that it's really just uh, pointing out uh, how serious sin is. That's it. They mean nothing. Gold means nothing. The, the fact that something had to be made with bronze versus silver and something had to be white linen versus, uh, you know, the purple or the blue or the scarlet. You're going to tell me all that stuff means nothing and just be summarized in that simple statement? Absolutely not. So, the Passover. Still to this day, and we just celebrated a couple weeks ago. The Passover points to the death of Christ, points forward to it, a prophetic event. Communion points back to that same death, and that is the new symbol for the Passover. So the symbol's been replaced. So keeping the feast days themselves, it's, it's worth nothing, right? So you have the Passover, Especially, and we're going to look at this very soon, the original Passover with the Jews in Egypt, the Hebrews, and then typified the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the first Passover. It's a plague to the unbelievers, but it's a blessing to the believers. That's interesting to me. Exodus starts in Exodus chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor, jewels and silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt. And in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. But the firstborn of, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beasts. So, now, we've sort of unlocked some of these symbols before. Egypt is symbolic of what? What was that? 
You know, <laughs> Egypt is symbolic of what? We all come from Egypt, right? We were all Egyptians at one point, spiritually speaking. What's that? Unbelief. Unbelief. Sometimes it's, it's uh, like the, with the king of the south, it could be total rejection, belief in God, right? Remember what Pharaoh said when, when Moses first asked him to let the children of Israel go? He says, who, who is the Lord that I should serve him? Non Unbelief. Unbelievers. So Egypt, there's a, there's time coming. This is what the Passover is all about. There's a time coming when the Lord will either pass over you because you are covered by the blood of the lamb or you will suffer the full wrath of God because of our choices. Any one of us can choose to be in the believing uh, class if we like. And each one, as, just as each one of us can choose to be in the unbelieving class. One of the questions that pops up so often, and it popped up again this week, is if God knows everything, then he knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. Then this is all his fault, right? <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that what you hear pretty often from, from non-believers, right? Or, or just people seeking? It's an honest question. But God, God loves free will. Just, just as each and every one of us, um, if we owned an animal, or better yet, a child, if you have your own child, you want the child to love you, right? You want the child to really love you, not because you're its master, if you will. That's what God wants, too. So, of course, God, God gave them the ability to be able to choose for themselves. Now, God also gave them a beautiful gift in that they didn't have the knowledge of sin. They didn't have the knowledge of evil. So in order for them to betray him, they wouldn't be tempted with all these things, in other words, right? Because they'd have no knowledge of it. They don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to them. So for them to be tested, he gave them probably uh, one of the most merciful tests you could think of. Don't eat from that tree. And what did they do? They willingly chose. So God, seeing us in our state, seeing that Eve was uh, tricked, if you will, willingly, um, and Adam, not deceived, willingly chose to die with Eve, seeing that we would be separated from him forever, he came up with the plan, you know, before it happened, actually. He came up with the plan to save us all by sending his own son to die in our place. Now imagine that. His son, the perfect, the creator, the majestic, the glorious, dies for the wretched, miserable. Why? So that we could break the law? No. So that he could, he could fulfill the requirements and penalty of the law and that he could uplift us, break the power of sin in our lives that we might keep the law and be with him forever. That's the gospel. And it's all because we chose wrong. This is where the finger needs to be pointed. Me. Paul? Well, you and Hilda are going to have a child now. You and Hilda are going to have a child. That child could grow up to be a mass murderer. Should you go get an abortion? Exactly. The child is no. going to grow up to be all kinds of problems. Should you not have the child? Or are you going to give that child every opportunity to accept Christ. That's the same thing. Absolutely. It was his fault that he gave us a choice. Is that what you want me to believe? No. He put the way of escape before the problem existed. It had to be played out. So then nobody should ever have a child because they may grow up to not do what the parents want them to do. So we should get rid of all the children. That's that same mentality exactly. to me, if you want to bring it down to our level. Or will the parents sacrifice everything and anything for that child, even up unto their, their own life? Yes. Absolutely, if they're a real parent. Give and them every even, opportunity. Even if they're a mass murderer, would the parent love the child any less? No. See, uh, the act of destruct. the Lord says, I take, I take no pleasure, <laughs> no pleasure in the death of the wicked. None. But that the wicked 
turn from his wicked ways and repent and have eternal life. That's what God wants. But if we're going to choose a path willingly of unbelief, as Pharaoh did, and harden our hearts, as Pharaoh did, against God and against his truth, then we can't be in the kingdom of heaven. And the law, which requires the death and penalty of every sinner, that payment will be paid, not by Christ, but by yourself. So that's why the Passover is so important, because this, this is the very act of God paying your debt and bringing you up to a place where you can be like Christ. He's, a, he's essentially doing an exchange. He's exchanging our wickedness, evil, rebellion, pouting. I mean, every, every sin that's in your life, he's exchanged. He's given you an exchange. He's saying, here, take my righteousness in its place and give me that garbage, <laughs> and I'll get rid of it. What an amazing gift. We are insane not to accept this. And it's every day yielding to Christ. Paul? Another thing about the Passover, and this was an issue that I used to run into a lot, that God doesn't kill. Well, take a close look at how that's recorded. I, being first person, yes. will go out into the midst of Egypt, and he will destroy. Who's the I there? That's Jesus. Who's going to minister judgment? It's a strange act for God to do this, but he will do it. If the blood of his son is not on our forehead, so to speak, or that house is still in Egypt, you're going to die. So that's another point about the Passover. I will go out in the midst of Egypt. Yes. It was Jesus that did it. Yes. So this is a big issue for those, oh, God doesn't kill. He would be breaking his own. No, no, no. Not no, one God, saved, always saved. God deals with the sin problem. And he does it for the benefit of the sinner and living for eternity in misery and eventually pointing to God and saying, how could you allow me to live like this for 60,000 years? I'm so miserable all the time and I can't die because I'm immortal, right? That's what would happen eventually. And then God would be at fault, right? So God, God does it out of love just as much for the sinner as for the benefit of his kingdom and his universe in removing the, the evil that's in the universe. Amazing, huh? <laughs> Exodus chapter 11, verses 6 through 7, And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of unbelief, such as there was none like it, nor shall there be, nor shall be like it any more, but against any of the children of Israel or the believers shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and the Israel and Israel. So God puts a difference between his people and the in other words, the ones the ones that are submissive to God, he puts a difference between those and the ones that just do whatever they want. Okay? or the ones that don't believe. He puts a difference between them. So as Paul said, God doesn't kill. God, God does deal with the sin problem. He does, and he will. And that's something we've got to understand. The Bible promises us. See, God means what he says. We treat him like a child sometimes, don't we? Like he doesn't mean what he says. The Bible says very clearly that when his wrath is poured out upon the world, that it will be unmingled with mercy. Now, and for the last 6,000 years, has been the time of mercy. This is your amnesty hour, as they call it. So if you don't take up the offer, and you choose, willingly choose rebellion, eventually, his wrath will be poured out without, without mercy. Just as it was upon his own son, at the Passover. Exodus chapter 12. You know, I didn't put it up here, but if you, if you finish up reading it in, the, in Exodus chapter 11, it says that uh, Moses, you know, he told, he told Pharaoh about this, and then Pharaoh t just told him to leave. And it says, Moses went out in great anger. And I was thinking, why was Moses greatly angered? You know, is it because he's just 
Pharaoh so rebellious? No. Because of the plague. Pharaoh is dooming not only himself, but all of his people to lose their firstborn of not only man but beast. And Moses is like, are you insane? How can you do this to your own people? I can see why Moses was angry when he left. But anyways, Exodus chapter uh, 12, verse 5 and 6. It says, your lamb... Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped one. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now this really gets into the Passover meal and sacrifice itself. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, I'll finish the quote, and then we'll go back to that. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, the beginning of months. Um, the way I understand this and what I've studied is ancient uh, Jewish culture had two, two years that sort of overlapped each other. And in the seventh month of, each, of that time frame, the way it overlaps would be the beginning of the next year. Let me explain what I mean. This, the first month of Abib, would be... Um, I'm trying to think of the number. I can't think of the number. Maybe this, for our calendar, the second month, okay? The second month of the year. Now, the begin, it says it's the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year. This is the first month of the sanctuary year, okay? This is when the sanctuary uh, would be the tabernacle, and all the sacrifices would be going daily, and then every single one of the feast days would be in a succession culminating in the Day of Atonement when the high priest would finally sit down and his work would be done. And that would finish the year. And that was a seven-month block beginning at this time. They also had a civil year, which began um, at the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, That's the first day of that, uh, first day of that month. And then the tenth day of that month was the Day of Atonement. So there's a little overlap there. That's the first day of their civil year, okay? So that's kind of what you're dealing with, and there's 12 months in the whole year, okay? So they have different year successions going on. Um, now, this is, in, what this, this is interesting right here. In the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. When was the lamb selected? The 10th day of the month, or in other words, four days prior to the Passover sacrifice which was on the 14th day of the month. It says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, Exodus uh, 12, 5 and 6, a male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and he shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, that's pretty load, loaded when you're thinking about what actually happened with Christ. Now, Christ, when was Christ selected as the Lamb of God? When was he selected? When was the first time anybody called him the Lamb of God? Can you remember that? John the Baptist. That was at his baptism, right? That was in A.D. 27. When, did, when, did, uh, when was Jesus hung on the cross? What year? A.D. 31. Three and a half years later. Right? So, think about this for a second. If, we're, if this is a, a, a miniature prophecy, if you will, the tenth day, exactly four days before the sacrifice was to be made, during the daytime, which would be already be halfway, about halfway through the day, right? In the morning you wake up, because you're not going to do it at night, not most people. So you're, you wake up in the morning, it's daytime. In biblical sense, the day is already half over, right? Because you have night, then day. Your lamb is selected at that time without blemish and without spot and taken away from the other sheep. 
And then, three and a half days later, that lamb is, is killed as the Passover lamb. Isn't that amazing? Right there. Right there in Exodus chapter 12, in, the, in, in just the, the laying out of, of just a minor detail like that, you can see Christ's life portrayed. Three and a half days later, he was, he was sacrificed. When does it say? Israel shall kill it in the evening. So Jesus died. So the whole day, in other words, when he comes, when he comes up and it's uh, the upper room, when nightfall hits, it's the Passover. Okay? So he celebrates communion and Passover with them. That He gets arrested in the middle of the night that night goes through all those trials, goes through the, the flogging and the scourging and all of that, uh, sentenced to death, and then he dies at the ninth hour, which is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, our time. Right? So that is just about the evening time. The Lamb of God was sacrificed. Isn't that amazing? Now, in Daniel chapter 9, we see this also, uh, 9, uh, 24 through 25, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Going on with the verse 26 and 27 of Daniel 9. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Over 1.1 million people died at that time. Did you know that? 1.1 million people were fleeing from the Romans after Cestus had left and they were going into Jerusalem trying to fortify it thinking it was a place of safety as the Romans were coming back and just massacring city after city after city. They were flocking to Jerusalem. All the Christians left at that time. All the Christians, every single one that put their faith in the Lamb of God, their Passover Lamb, they were gone. But every single one of the Jews that were there, they all flocked in. The city was, was exploding, overthrown. And, and they put a siege around the city. And they began to siege it. And finally, they broke through and they destroyed it. 1.1 million people back in that time died. To, to put it in perspective, about 80,000 people died when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And Nagasaki, another 70,000. That's, that's one-tenth of the amount of people that died in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So that's amazing right there. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant... <clears throat> this is the Messiah. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven years. And in the midst of the week or in the halfway point of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Right? And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And that's exactly what happened to Jerusalem. So, Taking the prophecy, we all know very well. It's a, the full study of it is for another time. But we have 457 B.C. as our start time, right? The 70 weeks, 490 years is the block that Israel has to make a decision, a final decision, whether they're going to be passed over or not, if you will. And the Messiah is born, or the, the Messiah is, is baptized after the 62 weeks, right? And the, and the seven weeks. So 69 weeks, Messiah uh, is baptized, 27 AD. He confirms the covenant with one, for one week. And in the midst of the week, 
he's crucified. Another three and a half years later, the stoning of Stephen, sealing their decision as a nation, right? Now, three and a half years, just like it's amazing, this, this prophecy points perfectly to Christ 20, in 27 AD. Three and a half years later, in 27 AD, the Lamb of God, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God was selected at that time. And he began his ministry. Now, during the Passover, uh, ancient Israel, when the lamb was selected on the 10th day, it was separated from the other sheep. And it was tied up somewhere separate from them so they could find it easier again. And it was meant to do this to, to sort of attract discussion about what the lamb symbolized and looking forward to the Messiah and things like that. So when you see Jesus, who was a carpenter before then, baptized, then begin his ministry, it's at that point that he has stepped out from among the sheep and has now become, let's say, a gazing stock, right? Because he was. He was doing miracles and, and all these things. People were coming to him, Gentiles included, were coming to him looking for hope, looking for peace. And he gave it to them. Now, as far as I think it's important to, to mention this, the 457 B.C. start date that we all hold it can be dated as the starting point of this prophecy based on Ezra 7. But uh, Ezra 7 states that that decree went out in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Now this date, the seventh year of Artaxerxes, can be confirmed as 457 B.C. based on the Greek Olympiad, Ptolemy's Canon, the Elephantine Papyri, and various Babylonian cuneiform tablets. It's a very well-established date that the beginning of the reign of Artaxerxes was exactly seven years before that, or, 480, or 463 B.C. Four separate uh, sources right there where you can prove that. So Luke chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. This is how we get the 27 A.D. number. Again, 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, 27 A.D., very easily well-established date in history. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Gal Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eteria, I always mess that up, and of the reign of Trachonitis and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then he met Jesus Christ. And he said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming and, uh, unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That title, Lamb of God, was... was by, because it wasn't John who thought of it, right? We, we got to remember the Holy Spirit's working on John. So, following the will of the Spirit, John sees Jesus, and the thought that comes to his mind is, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Or, the Passover Lamb that was sacrificed for us, that perfect Lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus confirms this. It says, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from, um, from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan in 27 AD. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth, driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. In other words, his ministry had began uh, and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. Pointing back to that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So, we have the Passovers for chronology here. And you can find these clearly in scripture. 
Jesus is baptized in about the autumn of A.D. 27. His first Passover, which is in the spring, was A.D. 28. You can see that in John chapter 2, verse 13 and 23. So there's six months of his ministry, or half a year. Okay? Second Passover, uh, 29 A.D., John 5, chapter 5, verse 1. That's one and a half years. So we have one and a half years now. His third Passover is in 30 A.D. You can find that in John uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Now we have two and a half years. His final Passover, the Passover which he died on, was in 31 A.D., three and a half years exactly. Just like the prophecy and just like the, the feast day said that the lamb would be selected on the 10th day, both fulfilled exactly as the Bible said. So, that beautiful little prophecy that's there. Ancient pass, uh, the ancient Passover, the lamb is selected three and a half days prior to sacrifice, or four days. Uh, Jesus is affirmed as the lamb of God and baptized exact same time. He's without blemish. Jesus was without sin. He was perfect. Remember uh, that quote we read from Peter? It says that he was the spotless lamb, or without blemish and without spot. And he's slain by and for the people in, in the ancient Passover. This one's a little different. He was mockingly slain. He was mockingly slain. He was murdered. Not slain as the lamb for their sins. Nevertheless, he was exactly that. How many things are just so ironic when you think about the moments leading up to Christ's death, the crown of thorns. Yes, he was a king. The... the the sign that was placed at his crucifixion, here is the king of the Jews written in three different languages, right? Mockingly, but he was a king. The robe that was given, the purple robe, he was a king. It's amazing. And he's mockingly slain, but for the sins of the entire world. You know, we, we've lost a lot of history because Rome writes our history now. But in many ancient cultures, including the Roman Empire at that time, they believed that the Christ, or the chosen one, the one that was going to bring in righteousness again, because they, everybody, everybody had the story of how we had lost, that there was a time of immense prosperity and goodness in the world, and that we had lost it somehow. Every, the oral traditions, you study it out, they all have that. They all have that. Even in the Roman Empire, they believed that the Christ would come out of Judea. At that time, when Jesus did come. There was a belief there permeated throughout that time. So now, back to Exodus. It says, They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. So, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins um, after the Passover. But it's also the night when the Passover happens. Because of the way a day is calculated, it is calculated from sunset to sunset. You think, think about this. The Passover lamb is sacrificed just before sunset. That day is the Passover day. The, when it's that night time, when you eat the Passover lamb sacrifice, it's the next day, which is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Does that make sense? And that was a Sabbath day. Now, in Jesus' time, it happened to fall on a Sabbath also, which would make it a high Sabbath. So they shall eat the flesh that night, roast it with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. So we are to eat the flesh of the lamb. And how do we do that? We do that by reading his word, by learning of him. And I would say if you're a busy person, a really busy person, if you have a radio in your car, I would highly, highly recommend that you find audiobooks of Ellen White. It's just, it's 
completely amazing what that little thing can do for you. It doesn't replace reading. It doesn't. But for people that are busy, really busy, you do your devotion, you're searching for, you want, you want more, you know? Someone like me, I, always want, I wish I had more time, you know, to do it. Those help very much. So you're eating, you're eating the flesh, and you were to roast it with fire and unleavened bread, all symbols of Christ. Christ was the unleavened bread. No sin was found in him. No sin. That's what leaven is. Leaven is various forms of doctrine and mindsets that are sinful, okay, and that, that permeate the rest of your dough, if you will, your bread, your spiritual food, and, and make it all no good. So Jesus is the unleavened bread. Um, we're to eat the flesh of Christ by reading his word, by praying, by being in obedience to him, by spreading the gospel. It was to be roasted with fire, and bitter herbs shall they eat it. Now, it says, eat not of it rod, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs. Now, why, why, was it, why couldn't you boil this flesh? Well, this is an I think moment because there's, there's nothing that I've found that actually tells me for sure. But this, this death that Jesus is, that this Passover lamb is suffering, it's to be roasted by fire and not cooked in any other way because it's symbolic of the second death. And it's called the lake of water? <laughs> the lake of fire. Yes, the lake of fire. Now, also, what I've found in uh, some studies is that when a lamb was roasted, it was, it was put on a stick that went through the body, okay, and its chest cavity was opened up, and its arms and legs were spread out, and it was basically nailed to a piece of wood just the same way Christ died for us, nailed to a piece of wood. And they rotate it and spin it kind of like a rotisserie. So it wasn't to be cooked. It was cooked in a specific way. Now, this is what we'll close with this, and we'll pick it up next time. From Mrs. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 278. It says, the lamb was to be eaten with bitter herbs, as pointing back to the bitterness of the bondage in Egypt, I just want to stop there real quick. When, when we are taking in communion, which is what this symbol is now, we are to think about where we've been, where we were before Christ found us. Do you remember your chains, brothers and sisters, that, the, that Satan and yourself forged together to bind you, your misery, your pain, your hopelessness, your confusion, before God. Those are your, that's your bitter herbs. And we should be thinking about those things, especially in communion when we, we remember what the Lord has done for each and every one of us. So when we feed upon Christ, and she puts this also, the Holy Spirit also says this with reading the Bible. So when we feed upon Christ, it should be with the contrition of heart because of our sins. The use of unleavened bread also was significant. It was expressly enjoined in the law of the Passover and is strictly observed by the Jews in their practice that no leaven should be found in their houses during the feast. In like manner, the leaven of sin, that's what it is, the leaven of sin must be put away from all who would receive life and nourishment from Christ. So there's a work to be done in our own lives. We aren't to just you see, they had to do something, didn't they? If they, if they had just, if they decided, I'm going to roast the lamb, but I'm not going to put the blood on the doorpost, would they have been safe? No. If they decided to not roast the lamb, but put the blood on the doorpost, would they have been safe? If they decided to, to roast the lamb, but they wanted to cook it in water, would they have been safe? If they did everything right and then decided to go outside of their homes when they were specifically told to stay inside, would they have been safe? No. So just like then is the same now. When the Lord reveals that there is leaven in our lives, we got to deal with it. We got to deal with it. We got to put it away so that we might serve the Lord, so that we might move on to the next step and the next strength. So he can really use us to change the world. Jesus spent three and a half years 
And who, who, who could be more successful? Think about this. Three and a half years with 12 individuals. And after those three and a half years, those 12 individuals, through the power of the Holy Spirit, turned the world upside down. What teacher can say that they have done that? Three and a half years it took him to remove the leaven. Of course, they had things I'm sure they still had to deal with. Uh, Paul mentions Peter having issues. But the leaven of sin being removed from our lives, that way he can use us as his instrumentalities for the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your Passover lamb. Thank you that when you see his blood upon us, Lord, that you pass us over, that you hold us not accountable for our sins, and that when we remove them from our lives, as you give us the strength to, Lord, and that we can walk in your law. Thank you so much, Lord, all of us, at one point or another, some still now have been in utter slavery to sin, Lord. A debt we can't pay and a chain we can't break. Lord, thank you for not only paying the debt, but breaking the chain. Help us all, Lord, to be transformed into the image of Christ in the world. That way when people see us, they will know that we have been with Jesus. Thank you, Lord for the amazing promises you have in Scripture that you will never leave nor forsake us and you will see to it that we get to that point if we are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.